All right, so we're on to item seven, our presentations. And uh, everyone knows that uh, during 2023, we're going to be exploring 175 plus years of Lafayette history. And we'll be doing this in collaboration with a very valuable community resource, the Lafayette Historical Society. And part of this collaboration is going to be a five to 10 minute presentation uh, on an aspect of Lafayette history uh, during the first council meeting of each month. Now, the plus in 175 plus years is very important. Uh, in part, it means we want to go back before uh, Elam Brown came to Lafayette and include in our celebration a recognition and understanding of the indigenous people who were here on this land for thousands of years. So to start us off, uh, I'm going to give the floor to Mary McCosker, who is the president of the Lafayette Historical Society. Welcome, Mary. Sorry, I'm here. And I'm going to fire through this because I have to be in Moraga to do a program at 745. So we're going to be quick. Can you see the screen? Yes. OK, perfect. OK, so I have a few pictures to go along with my little talk. And thank you for including the Historical Society. You'll be seeing me and hopefully a few other people from our group over the next few months. So thank you for including us. Thousands of years ago, there were many groups of indigenous people living in what is today California. Those people living in the local area were the Sakwan people. They were a part of a larger Miwok tribe that lived in Central California. Okay, now I gotta figure out how to make this thing advance. Hmm, perplexing. Oh, here we go, okay. The Sakwan were of average height with coarse black hair and brown eyes. Men and women often wore tattoos on their bodies that told of their families or lineage. Some tattoos were decorative. Some were the symbol of the spirit meaning of an animal, bird, or human being. Women and men wore their hair long, letting it grow throughout their lives. Although when someone in their tribe died, they would cut their hair as a sign of respect or mourning. Saklan homes were tule grass huts constructed using willow branches and tule grass, which grew in the creeks. Willow branches are very pliable and can bend without breaking. The willow branches were pushed into the ground and then attached using strips of willow bark to form a frame. Tule grasses from nearby creeks were layered over the frame to finish the home. Larger huts often could hold one or two families. Blankets of deer skin, bear skin, and woven rabbit skin lay around a central fire pit. Groups of huts were often built near large pieces of bedrock where acorns were crushed with pestles in the making of acorn mush. Local villages in our area were generally situated near creeks, so water was readily available. Creeks were an important part of native life as they provided water for drinking, cooking, and bathing. Fish, such as salmon and steelhead, which were part of the native diet, were abundant in the creeks. Other animals came to the creeks for water, so the Sakhalon were often able to capture them near the creeks. In villages of tribes of 50 to 100 persons, each family took care of its own needs, making its own bows and arrows, baskets and nets, and hunting for game and fish. These tribelets had about 10 square miles of territory, and each tribelet might speak a different dialect, often leading to nonverbal ways of trading. Buckeye was another plant that grew in this area. Buckeyes produce a nut that is covered with a thick skin. When the skin was removed and the nut dried out, it was used to help hunt for food. When fish were found in creeks, Parts of the creeks were blocked off so the fish could not escape. Then the Sakhalon would throw pieces of chopped soap root bulbs or mashed buckeyes into the pool. A substance in the plants stunned the fish, which floated to the surface, unconscious, but still completely edible. Other indigenous plants to this area are the oak, 
the willow and the bay laurel trees and flowers such as poppies and lupin. The arroyo willow was a plant used by the Sothlon in several ways. Willow leaves were chewed or made into a tea to alleviate pain. The branches of the willow were used in the building of huts and bark from the branches was used to tie things together. Willow bark was also used to make skirts, which women tied around their waists. Sothlon women and men wore deerskin skirts or loincloths. As the Sakhlon wore no shoes or sandals, their feet were hardened by a lifetime of walking barefoot. Necklaces made of shells and feathers were often worn by the women. In the winter, mud might be smeared on people's bodies to keep them warm. Indigenous animals were foxes, raccoons, deer, bobcats, grizzly bears, and coyotes, many of which still exist here today. The Sakhlon did not rely on one single staple food as there were an abundance of food sources for them to eat. Other animals that were hunted as food were birds, deer, gophers, insects, lizards, snakes, moles, mice, ground squirrels, rabbits, raccoons, and foxes. For clothing and bedding, the gray fox and the black-tailed jackrabbit, the bobcat, raccoon, and possum were preferred. The Sakhlon knew a great deal about how animals thought and acted. They were skillful at tracking and expert at making animal calls and had such keen senses that they could sometimes smell an animal even before they could see it. Although they hunted many animals, they did not hunt coyote as they believed that coyote had created the world. They worshiped and respected him. The Sakhlons also collected seeds that grew in the area. In the fall, when the seeds were ripe, they would use woven paddles to knock the seeds into their baskets and then would roast the seeds in the fire before eating them. The most important indigenous plant to the Sakhlon were the oak trees that grew in abundance in this area because they produced acorns, a staple food of the native people. There are two main types of oaks. The coast live oak grows throughout the Bay Area. It has prickly leaves and produces smallish acorns. Although this tree loses many of its leaves in the fall and winter, it never loses all of its leaves. Live oaks can produce as many as 200 pounds of acorns each year. The valley oak occupies the inland valleys of our region. It has larger flat leaves and produces bigger acorns. In winter, all of its leaves have fallen off, leaving its branches bare. Valley oaks can produce around 350 to 500 pounds of acorns each year. A family of five people could collect over 33,000 pounds of acorns in two weeks if they worked eight hours a day. Throughout the year, the people held various feasts, gatherings, and religious dances, many of them tied to the biological rhythms of the oak trees. The acorn harvest in the fall marked the beginning of the new year. Winter was spoken of as so many moons after the acorn harvest. Summer as so many moons before the next acorn harvest. Each fall, the members of the tribe would all work together to collect as many acorns as possible. First, they would collect near the village, then go farther out to find more, or more oak trees and more acorns. It was important to collect as many acorns as possible since they would have to last through the winter, spring, and summer until more acorns would be ripe again in the fall. Other native animals depended on acorns for food as well. Blue jays, squirrels, deer, and woodpeckers all ate acorns as part of their diet. After the acorns were collected, they had to be saved for many months. Large storage baskets called granaries were constructed to hold the acorns. They were built to hold acorns away from the ground so they wouldn't get wet and moldy if it rained. The granaries were lined with bay laurel leaves to keep insects out. A top made of leaves or grass kept out other animals. Other Miwok tribes built different types of granaries, but all were used to store collected acorns. The type of granary that was constructed depended on the materials available to use. Tools used by the Sakhlon were often made from stones. They were used for digging, for grinding, and for hammering. Digging sticks were also used as tools. 
The Saklan traded with other tribes for things they needed. Sopru could be traded for obsidian, for arrowheads, spear points, knives, and scrapers. Acorns could be traded with coast Miwok tribes for shells to make necklaces. Obsidian trade among native tribes went on for over 4,000 years and was one of the earliest items of trade in prehistoric California. With the arrival of the Spanish explorers in the mid 1770s, the lives of the Sakhalin people changed drastically. By the early 19th century, many of the Sakhalin were gone from the area, having died from diseases brought by the Spanish, having become missionized by the Catholic Church, or having left the area to escape the rule of the white man. Some land lay uninhabited for many years until the lure of inexpensive fertile land brought Yankee settlers from the East. It's important to know about indigenous people and their ways of life because they have lived here for thousands of years longer than anyone else since the human world began according to their accounts of creation. By learning about their cultures and about these people today, it is hoped we might learn to live in a closer way with other peoples and nature. Thank you. Mary, thank you very much. Let me ask you, uh, do you have time for questions or do you have to leave for Moraga now? I have to be doing, uh, there's a meeting at 745 and I have the computer with the, with the PowerPoint on it. So <laughs> if anyone wants to email me or if anybody wants to come to the history room or if anybody wants to wait till next time and <laughs> ask questions, I'll have more time. I apologize for the craziness tonight. No, 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 that's uh, my fault. So. Uh, we will we'll save our questions and please for do your next report okay. in February. Thank you very much. You're very Thank welcome. You. See you later. Thank you.